Everybody here. So another gorgeous summer afternoon here in Sydney. Just listening to a Vanity Fair article on Apple News Plus and uh, talking about is a is a civil war already underway in rural America. So from an Australian perspective, all this American civil war talk just seems absolutely absurd. Right? There's no civil war talk here in Australia. I don't think I've ever had anyone in my three months in Australia try to talk to me about the Prime Minister. There's like very little concern about politics. Like culture war issues are about 5-10% of the intensity in the United States. There's American enthusiasm, including enthusiasm for civil war versus Australian reticence. Americans tend to be much more enthusiastic than Australians. Australians tend to be much more fatalistic. The 1776 revolution is you know, still beating in the hearts of many Americans. So it creates a different ethos that you know, we need to band together to take back this country. Right? That's a very American way of speaking. I didn't hear a lot of that in Australia. That Australians who are dissatisfied with the direction of the country, they'll talk about, oh, nothing you can do about it. They might as well just have a good time with your mates. Right, interesting New Yorker essay here on what's the matter with men. And uh, off the top of my head, I'm thinking men don't like to compete with women. So in the push for female equality, you've got all these laws that are essentially forcing men to start competing with women in ways that they had to do before and men just do not like to compete directly with women so men will, will drop out rather than fight directly with women also you know, fighting and competing is generally you know essential to male nature fighting and competing is probably the primary source of meaning for men and in our increasingly feminized world you know fighting and competing is looked down upon particularly for boys and so we're creating a society in America that is you know, less and less friendly to men, particularly men on the margins, men who aren't hyper-educated into the norms of you know, middle-aged women. Right, what's the matter with men? New Yorker essay here. Boys and Men argues for a speedy response because the decline in the fortunes of present-day men not only in comparison with women, but in absolute terms, augurs so poorly for men several decades on. As far as I can tell, nobody predicted that women would over... Yeah, so what's going on with a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old is profoundly likely to be the future direction of that child. So I was a troubled four or five-year-old, right? and I you know, ended up being a troubled adult. I was kind of antisocial four or five year old and I went on to carry many of those antisocial tendencies with me into adulthood. You can get you know, a five year old's IQ score reasonably accurately and have a pretty good idea of the future direction of their life. Remember my father would often tell me you'll only learn through pain. And we kind of saw us heading in some bad directions. He kept repeating you'll only learn through pain take men so rapidly, so comprehensively, or so consistently around the world, Reeves writes. He notes that schoolgirls outperform schoolboys both in advanced countries that still struggle with considerable sexism, such as South Korea, and in notably egalitarian countries like Sweden, where researchers say they are confronting a boy crisis, or boy crisis. In 2009, American high school students in the top 10% of their freshman class were twice as likely to be female. Boys mean. So even in very traditional societies with traditional, you know, male roles like South Korea, it sounds like men are also struggling. Boys are also struggling. So it's not just word culture. While are at least twice as likely to be diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and twice as likely to be suspended. Their dropout rates to yeah, men want to fight, right? Men get less of their, their meaning in life from competition and, and fighting. So men are also much more impulsive. So I think that like the widespread legalization of gambling is going to be particularly bad for men because men are much more likely to do that sort of, you know, thrill-seeking activity. So you can, you can help design a society that's more or less friendly for men or for women and for families, all right? I'm not a libertarian, you know, I think that you need guardrails, 
right? To discourage gambling, discourage prostitution, discourage the taking of drugs. So I was kind of shocked that there was essentially a whorehouse in Tenham Sands when I was visiting, but it was perfectly legal. So I was listening to the author of Dopamine Nation, Nation N.L. Lemke, a Stanford psychiatrist who specializes in addiction. And she made the point that the easier you make it to access you know, addictive substances and processes, the more likely people will pick them up. So I'm not a libertarian. I, I think society has an interest in erecting bulwarks. So I'm, I'm for erecting bulwarks to discourage gambling and to say making access to pornography more difficult. Uh, I'm for you know the current criminalization of, of drugs. Right? I am not in favor of the legalization of prostitution. So the easier you make it for people to engage in these activities, the more people will do them. Because for most people, their idea of what is moral is essentially you know, what is legal. And men in particular, I think, need these kind of social guardrails. Because men are much more likely to color outside the lines. Are considerably higher than those of their female counterparts. Young men are also four times as likely to die from suicide. This story pushes to the side the male favoring disparities in the world of work. The gender pay gap is usually described by noting that a woman earns 84 cents for every dollar earned by a man. The so every social arrangement is going to favor men or women or gays or straights, right? It's impossible to achieve equity and it's uh, a foolish, foolish quest. Right? Inequality, hierarchy, I think these are uh, built into nature, built into the way people organize themselves. This is up from 64 cents in 1980. Barely one-tenth of the CEOs in the Fortune 500 are women, and that is itself a 26-fold increase since 2000, when only two women were in the club. The Me Too movement began just five years ago. The sexual harassment that women face has hardly been extinguished. Even in the workplace, however, gender convergence may be arriving sooner than anticipated. An axiom of policymaking is that disparate educational achievement today will manifest in disparate earnings. No, we're not going to have uh, convergence, right? There'll always be some sectors of the workforce where men in particular excel and other sectors where women excel. So you have all these female gyms, but uh, do you have any men-only gyms? The female-only spaces is considered a good thing, but uh, male-only spaces in general are considered bad things. I think this is a serious mistake. Later, Reeves points out that women earn roughly three-fifths of all bachelor's and master's degrees awarded. They are the majority of current medical and law students and they've made extraordinary gains in subjects where they had once been highly underrepresented. They now constitute a third of current graduates in STEM fields and more than 40% of students in business schools. Much of the gender gap in pay, as Claudia Golden, a labor economist at Harvard notes, is driven not by direct discrimination, our conventional understanding of a sexist boss paying a female employee less than an identically situated male one, but by differences in occupational choice. A more elusive target has been indirect forms of discrimination, including those sustained by social conditioning. Life discriminates, right? The, the, the many varied tasks of life discriminate, you know, different professions discriminate, everything discriminates. Right? It's silly to regard discrimination ipso facto as a bad thing. It helps explain the gender skew of certain occupations and domestic arrangements that favor men. Within occupations, there's often no wage gap until women have children and reduce their work hours. For most women, having a child is the economic equivalent of being hit by a meteorite, Reeves observes. For most men, it barely makes a dent. Golden's analysis is blunt. The gender gap in hourly compensation would vanish if long, inflexible work days and weeks weren't profitable to employers. Yet, there may be reason for optimism. So Americans like work harder at longer hours, you know, get less guaranteed vacation than any other first world nation of which I'm aware. Like every Australian gets a minimum of a month holiday a year. 
The years-long pandemic and the subsequent labor shortage have forced employers to be more flexible in scheduling, particularly within the most highly remunerated white-collar professions. If that situation endures, the gender pay gap could continue its decline and boardrooms may become more balanced by attrition. Good things can also come about for bad reasons, though. Even if, as the French economist Thomas Piketty has suggested, global wars have helped reduce inequality between the rich and the poor, egalitarians should hesitate to become warmongers. And so it's chastening to realize that the substantial decline in the gender earnings gap is partly the result of stagnating wages for working men, which have not grown appreciably in the past half century. And why have wages not grown appreciably? Is it just you know, uh, a bizarre chance? No, it's the result of government policy. Wages are determined by how much immigration a country allows. Right? The more immigration, the slower wage growth. So construction wages, you know, a male-dominated profession, have been stagnant in the United States for 60 years because of the massive influx of immigration. So 1984-85, I went back to Australia and I was earning at various jobs between about $15 and $30 an hour. I came back to the United States and uh, most of the jobs that I could get were for about $4 an hour. Adjusting for inflation and partly of the steady creep in the number of men who drop out of the labor force entirely. We have some idea of why blue collar wages have stagnated. A macroeconomic shift that greatly raised the value of a college degree, owing in part to the decimation of manual labor by automation and globalization. Yeah, they don't talk about immigration, but immigration is the number one reason why wages have been so stagnant in the United States for the less educated. White men experienced a specific blow that black men had felt earlier and even more acutely. In a classic study, The Truly Disadvantaged, the sociologist William Julius Wilson argued that early waves of deindustrialization after the Second World War devastated the lives of working class African Americans who were buffeted both by economic forces in the form of greater rates of joblessness and by social ones, including worsened prospects for marriage. Yeah, no mention of immigration, right? It's immigration that drove down wages. Right? Employers would frequently rather employ uh, Mexicans and uh, Central Americans rather than African Americans. Later came the effects of the so-called China shock. The contraction of American manufacturing, a male skewing sector, as a result of increased trade. David Autor, an economist at MIT, estimates that normalizing trade relations with China in 2001 cost as many as 2 million American jobs, often in places that had not recovered even a decade later. A shelf of popular books about the white working class are... So right now, America has a 3.5% unemployment rate. So basically everyone who wants a job has a job now in the United States. So this problem that they're talking about should be rebounding, except we have so much immigration that wages are quite low, and so fewer people are incentivized to work relatively lowly paid jobs. The Oak Shields, Strangers in Their Own Land, Amy Goldstein's Jamesville, even the newly minted Senator J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy have sought to reckon with the social consequences of these economic transformations. None of them conveys much optimism. What should we make of the growing tendency of men to drop out of the workforce? So America tends to be a much more optimistic country than England or Australia, where you have much more of an attitude of fatalism but uh, you don't have a rampant epidemic of pessimism in, in Australia right now that I detect, right? There's no sense that you know, Australia is falling apart, you know, that Australia's best days are behind it. So American exuberance tends to swing wildly from, from optimism to pessimism. In the past half century, fewer and fewer men have returned to work after each recession like a ball that can never match its previous height as it... Yeah, well, they're reacting to incentives. Immigration... Immigration's crush wages for the less educated. And so people are going on permanent welfare instead of working an unprestigious, low-paying job. Rebounds. In 1960, 
97% of men of prime age, between 25 and 54, were working. Today, close to one in nine prime age men is neither working nor seeking work. In the recently reissued Men Without Work post-pandemic edition, Templeton, the conservative demographer and economist, Nicholas Eberstadt, points out that men are now employed at roughly the same rate as in 1940, back when America was still recovering from the Great Depression. Citing time use surveys, the detailed diaries that the Bureau of Labor Statistics compiles on how Americans spend their days, Eberstadt reports that most of these hours of free time are spent watching screens rather than doing household labor or caring for family members. Yeah, because they've been replaced by generous welfare payments and they've been disincentivized to work by rampant immigration. Also, the space for male-only spaces has been crushed and so you don't have the same workforce camaraderie that you had when it was single sex. Right, so civil rights legislation has hurt the majority and has hurt men while helping women and minorities. Instead of socializing more, men without work are even less involved in their communities than those with jobs. Yeah, a man without a job will usually feel empty inside. He won't have the inner strength to get out there and introduce himself to other people. He will tend to isolate. The available data suggests that their lot is not a happy one. So yeah, when I've not had work or struggled with work, right, I have not made many videos. Right, I've largely become reclusive. Right, you know, I, I feel lacking in confidence when I don't have a steady income. It would help if we had a firm grasp on why men are withdrawing from work. Many economists have theories. Eberstadt believes that something like infantilization besets some unworking men. He notes the availability of disability insurance programs. Roughly a third of non-working men reported some kind of disability in 2016. I mean, yeah, you're going to report disability if work is poorly paid, lacking prestige, you're not needed by a woman, right? nobody needs you, then you're going to be incentivized to check out. Right? You're not going to hold your head up high. Overall expansion of the social safety net after the 1960s. In 2017, the late Alan Kruger, who chaired President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, calculated that nearly half of all non-working men were taking pain medication on a daily basis and argued that the increased prescribing of opioids could explain a lot of the decline in the male labor force. Yeah, you're seeing despair, right? They're less educated, frequently less intelligent men, less able to navigate today's more feminized world and they have fewer male-only spaces to recharge it. Eric Hurst, an economist at the University of Chicago, thinks that the rapid improvement in video game quality could account for much of the especially deep drop in work among younger men. Right, if you can't be a hero in the real world, you'll find a space where you can be a hero. Some people that will be a religion, for other people will be video games. Right? If the real world is not treating you kindly. Right? And if the real world doesn't offer you an opportunity to be heroic, then you'll look for a way to be heroic in things like video games and fantasies. Like I checked out into fantasy fairly early on in my life. You know, I was struggling in the real world, navigating relationships with people. I, I wasn't you know, an esteemed member of you know, the community when I was four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? It wasn't one of the most popular and prestigious kids in school, so I checked out into a world of fantasy. But Medley calls this good-for-nothing nationalism. Anyone who has recently played or momentarily lost a loved one to Elden Ring or God of War Ragnarok can grasp the immersive spell that video games cast. But... Right. People want to do what they're good at. Right? If you're not good at your job or you're not good at some volunteer position or you're not good at uh, a role for your family or community, then you're gonna go online, right? Where you can be a hero online. You can be a keyboard warrior. In the end, most economists admit that they cannot settle on an exact ideology for the problem of non-working men. The former Treasury Secretary and Harvard President, Larry Summers, who was not known for his intellectual humility, recently surmised that the answers here lie more in the realm of sociology than they do in economics. Reeves, 
Yeah, I bet you can answer that with, with economics, right? Low pay, low prestige in unappealing jobs that are less likely to be in you know, all male spaces where you're increasingly regulated by laws and administrations and HR processes that are designed to favor the, the mores of the single woman, right? Men are gonna drop out of that kind of world. Men are not gonna compete. Men are not gonna fight directly with women, generally speaking. So they're gonna look for a space where they can fight and be heroic. And if you destroy the workplace and you destroy male only spaces, then men will retreat, retreat, tr retreat. Lib says, I recall the blogger line of the blogosphere writing that in the future governments will pay citizens to play video games for a living. Nick Fuentes, Twitter ban lifted. Two things that we can't explain the economic decline of men without looking at non economic factors. Yeah, notice absolutely no mention of immigration. Right? If you stopped immigration, then regular blokes could be heroes. They could earn a great wage and could afford a wife and family. By allowing massive immigration, we make it difficult, more difficult for blokes to be heroes and to support a wife and family. It's not that complicated. Massive immigration drives up real estate prices, drives up rent, right? deteriorates public spaces, right? makes your, your average person you know, less comfortable in society. Right, you have to be, you know, higher IQ to deal with successfully with all the diversity. So you're diminishing the quality of public spaces for your average bloke, diminishing his chances to be a hero, you're diminishing his chances to earn a good wage and to be able to afford a wife and kids. It's the primary, I think the primary point here is immigration, absolutely not mentioned by this New Yorker article. It is not that men have fewer opportunities, is that they are not taking them. Well, why are they not taking them? Because the opportunities for, say, the 100 IQ crowd and below are considerably shrunk as compared to, say, 70 years ago when we didn't have so much unchecked immigration. An intersectional approach may prove useful here. Consider a recent landmark study of income tax returns in which it was definitively established that black Americans go on to earn substantially less than whites, even if their parents were similarly wealthy. Remarkably, the gap is due entirely to the differing prospects for black men relative to white men. No, the gap is due entirely, according to some studies, to IQ differences. In fact, black women earn slightly more than white women who came from economically matched households. Sex-specific variables, like the extraordinarily high rate of incarceration among black men, are evidently holding back progress. Yeah, the reason you get incarcerated is because you're doing heinous, heinous, horrible, awful, stupid, destructive, vicious, nasty, cruel, selfish things. All right? Getting incarcerated is the symptom of a much deeper issue, which is antisocial behavior uh, by, by parts by a tiny proportion of the black male community. And incarceration is only a symptom of this much deeper, more difficult issue. Although boys are as likely as girls to grow up in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty or in fractured families, sex at birth being almost a pure coin toss, an emerging body of evidence suggests that boys may be less resilient to such adversity. In a paper titled The Trouble with Boys, the economists Marianne Bertrand and Jessica Pan found that boys raised outside of a traditional family with two biological parents present fare especially poorly. With Look, there are some ways that women are extra vulnerable. So I've been in Australia for almost three months now. I've never once felt fear. Like I went hiking through Royal National Park, didn't see a human being for three hours. I started to feel the outside glimmerings of fear, but didn't really feel fear itself. On the other hand, women feel fear you know, every day, multiple times a day. So, you know, fear of physical violence, fear of rape, all right, that's something that women feel you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 times more, more than men. On the other hand, you know, men have other vulnerabilities, such as their, their need to be a hero to their, to their wife and kids. Substantially worse behavior in school and considerably lower skills in non-cognitive areas, such as emotional sensitivity and persistence. Yeah, but once you account for genetics, right, it, it may not be growing up without an intact family. It may be the type of children who proceed from 
uh, single parent families are coming from you know, antisocial parents. Increasingly matter in the workplace. The gender gap in school suspensions, already large, more than doubles among children with single mothers. Reeves offers a wide menu of policies designed to foster a pro-social masculinity for a post-feminist world. He would encourage more men to become nurses and teachers, expand paid leave, and create a thousand more... So, teaching is a profession that's dominated by female mores. Right? It's, many men find it emasculating. Vocational high schools. His signature idea, though, is to redshirt boys and give them all by default an extra year of kindergarten. The aim is to compensate for their slower rates of adolescent brain development, particularly in the prefrontal cortex, which controls decision making. Reeves, who places great stock in this biological difference, also places great stock in his proposed remedy. Men's excess risk taking compared to women results in the former slow life expectancy. Yeah, good point, Glib. A raft of studies of red-shirted boys have shown dramatic reductions in hyperactivity and inattention through the elementary school years, higher levels of life satisfaction, lower chances of being held back a grade later, and higher test scores. If that sounds too good to be true, it may well be. One of the studies he cites concludes that there is little evidence that being older than one's classmates has any long-term positive effect on adult outcomes such as IQ, earnings, or educational attainment. Yeah, I'm wholly, highly, highly, highly skeptical that artificially keeping boys in kindergarten for two years rather than one is uh, some positive step forward. On the contrary, it finds substantial evidence that the practice is linked to higher high school dropout rates and lower overall earnings. Reeves insists that he'd be vindicated if the protocol were applied more widely, but his case isn't very strong. We might hesitate before prescribing half the population an unusually strong and uncertain medicine. Still, he is at least proposing serious solutions. Many of his fellow liberals remain undecided about... Okay, I've got a serious solution okay stop immigration right roll back civil rights legislation you know allow for more male only spaces right reduce the incentives for you know the, the role of hr ladies right reducing rolling back weakening civil rights legislation uh, and, and therefore the accompanying you know rise in administrators and hr ladies and, sensitivity training, you know, you know HR, middle-aged lady, you know, sens you know, sensibility, right, it would make work, you know, a more attractive space for men. If you crushed immigration, men could then earn a good wage, and uh, they could afford a wife and kids, and that's the, the normal way for a man to feel like a hero. Whether the low-par outcomes for males even merit attention, let alone efforts to remedy them. The political right has eagerly filled the void. At the 2021 National Conservatism Conference, the Republican Senator, Josh Hawley, gave a keynote speech on the crisis of masculinity, in which he blamed an effort the left has been at for years now, guided by the premise that the deconstruction of America begins with and depends on the deconstruction of American men. Hawley, who is planning to expound upon his thoughts in a forthcoming book titled Manhood, argued that the solution must begin with repudiating the lie that America is systemically oppressive and men are systemically responsible, and with rebuilding those manufacturing and production sectors that so much of the chattering class has written off as relics of the past. Yeah, so some of the, the less sane and right, some of the more psychically vulnerable, right, they probably take to heart all the anti-male, anti-white, anti-Christian propaganda that they get force-fed. So I don't think it shifts most people, but yeah, I think a minority of people are probably negatively affected. Meanwhile, the mass market appeal of the contentious cultural commentator Jordan Peterson suggests an appetite for quasi-spiritual self-help. Stand up straight with your shoulders back in a secular age. Goop for young men. The vintage machismo that Donald Trump so prizes may explain why the gender gap in the popular opinion of him was so large. And the swing among Hispanic voters towards Republicans is being driven, in no small part, by Hispanic men. How men are faring in school and at work may not arouse everyone's concern. 
but how men choose to pursue politics inevitably affects us all. Uh-oh, phone needs to cool down before you can use it. It's way too hot out here. Gotta cool down my phone. Alright, gotta find a spot in the shade. Talk to you later.